I'm Sarah Howard, I'm Curator of Social Practice at the University of South Florida Contemporary Art Museum, and we are so appreciative of you joining us for this morning for this panel discussion featuring Reverend Houston Cypress, Betty Osceola, Robert Rosta, and Dr. Thomas Plunkham. Following some opening remarks, I will introduce each of our panelists who will provide a brief presentation to give you some background on their role in indigenous culture, cultural and environmental pres preservation efforts and the organizations they are associated with before we dive into our discussion. We'll allow time for questions from the audience at the end of the discussion. I would like to start by sharing a land acknowledgement the University of South Florida re resides on tr the traditional homelands and territories of the Seminole, as well as historical groups, inclu including the Calusa and Tocobaga. The state of Florida is now home to the Seminole, Miccosukee, Muscogee, and Choctaw, and individuals of many other native groups. The USF Contemporary Art Museum respectfully acknowledges and values these communities and will approach our programs, our collection, and our relationships in ways that honor the perspectives and contributions of indigenous peoples. November is Native America Heritage Month, and if you're interested in learning more about the historic and contemporary indigenous nations around the globe, I encourage you to visit Native, the Native Land Digital Platform, an indigenous-led nonprofit based in Canada as well as other resources for local Florida tribes, including the Seminole and Miccosokees. This program is part of CAM's educational events associated with the exhibition Native America in Translation, curated by Apsalaka artist Wendy Red Star and organized by Aperture. If you haven't had an opportunity to see the exhibition, CAM's curator of education, Leslie Alsasser will be providing a tour of the exhibition following today's program at 1, 1 p.m. Native America in Translation assembles the wide-ranging work of nine indigenous artists who pose challenging questions about identity and heritage, land rights, and histories of colonialism. Probing the legacies of settler colonialism and photography's complex and often fraught role in constructing representation of Native cultures the exhibition includes work by lens-based artists offering new perspectives on indigenous identity, reimagining what it be, means to be a citizen in North America today. Native American translation is made possible in part with generous support from the National Endowment for the Arts. The USF CAM presentation is supported by, in part by the USF College of the Arts, the Lee and Victor Levengood Endowment, the USF CAM Art for Community Engagement Fund patrons, and the Florida Department of State Florida Arts and Culture. Funding for this program was provided through a grant by the, from the Florida Humanities with funds from the National Endowment of, of, for the Humanities. And inside your program is a survey about this event today, and if you feel so inclined, we would really appreciate it if you could complete it, and we will collect it, uh, them outside in the lobby as you exit. I want to extend deep gratitude to the incredibly talented team at CAM for their valuable efforts that contributed to all aspects of organizing and promoting this program. And special thanks to CAM's Curator of Education, Leslie Elsasser, for her organization of the panel, New Media, media Curator, Communication and Technology Manager, Don Fuller, for promoting and documenting the event, Events Coordinator, Tammy Thomas, for organizing the event space and reception, and Program Coordinator Amy Allison and Deputy Director Randall West for managing all aspects of the Florida Humanities Grant and associated activities. We developed this program to, to provide a space to explore, listen, and learn about issues and impacts on our local indigenous communities and to forge new frameworks and understanding for contemporary indigenous identity and sovereignty that promotes equitable, cultural, and environmental policies and practices. We are honored to have assembled such a distinguished panel of voices from the fields of art, anthropology, tribal cultural preservation, and environmental advocacy to generate deeper conversations to address marginalized histories, repatriation, and foster greater awareness of indigenous approaches for preserving cultural and environmental health and well being for current and future generations of Floridians. Now for introductions for our featured guests who will provide a brief overview of their research and advocacy efforts. Let's start with Houston, Reverend Houston Cypress. 
is a two-spirit poet, artist, and activist from the Otter Clan of the Masoki Tribe of Indians of Florida. Through his artistic practice, Houston explores and articulates queer ecological knowledge through community-based artistic, mystical, and shamanistic techniques and deep listening, ceremony, pilgrimage, and service. Cypress serves as the head of Love the Everglades, an environmental nonprofit focused on indigenous solidarity, action, art, multi-faith coalition building, and reciprocity with nature. Cypress also uses his platform to speak out as an advocate for two, the two-spirited and non-binary gender peoples, indigenous cultural preservation, business develop, and sovereignty. In 2017, Cypress presented at the Institute for Contemporary Arts, Art Miami's Art and Research Center, and in 2022, Cypress was recognized with the Grassroots Activism Award and the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Poetry Award, as well as the Ellie's Just Social Justice Award created by Ula Arts, Ulight Arts to honor artists who have made a commitment to working for equality in their daily lives and artistic practice. Recently, Cypress co-created a short film produced by Super Blue and Nowness, and Cypress's work was recently on view as part of a Reclaiming Home contemporary seminal art at the John and Mabel Ringling Museum of Art in Sarasota, Florida. Cypress is currently an artist and resident at Ulite Arts in Miami. Please join me in welcoming Houston Cypress. Well, thank you, friends and family. It's an honor to be with you here today. I just wanted to share a little bit about my work through the Love the Everglades movement. It's a, today it's a 501c3 nonprofit, but back when me and my friends started, it was very informal. Mm, I guess it's important to note that when me and my buddy started this project, we were both attending art school. And after we graduated, a couple years after that, we found ourselves working and still collaborating together. And at the time, we were working for the Miccosukee Tribes TV program, and that job took us out into the Everglades so many times. And one of those field trips that we took was to document the Miccosukee Tribes Everglades study that they do in the fall and in the spring. The fall one is pretty amazing. It's a community event. There's like 20 or 30 airboats in a caravan, so everybody's cruising around. The scientists are taking their measurements. The elders are telling their stories. And that one of these trips, my buddy Gene was really moved by what he was hearing the elders talk about. So we took it upon ourselves to double dare each other. And the double dare was, how can we get people to care about the Everglades if they've never been there? And then the other side was, how can we encourage people to give the water the respect it deserves? So that was the double dare, and that's eventually how we started the Love the Everglades movement. And since that time, we've just really been experimenting with different kinds of tactics and different strategies. Um, and eventually, it's become like an art project. And the medium that we work with is the land itself and the communities that we work with. So we're talking about a social practice here. But we also wanted to do and model what is it like for us to be in solidarity with the Native communities. And for us as an organization, the best way for us to do that is to take the indigenous priorities and to make those our priorities. And we're also learning and respecting what Miccosukee and Seminole folks are sharing publicly. And so in seeing these public messages, we developed our own approach as a full spectrum form of advocacy. And that means we talk to and we advocate on the um, physical, mental, and spiritual levels. Like we try to be very eclectic and holistic in the kind of work that we do. Um, I guess we're also doing our best to expand the discourse when it comes to Everglades advocacy. Like, what I'm talking about is what is acceptable when we're advocating for the Everglades? Do we only talk about politics and only talk about science? Or can we embrace arts and spirituality in talking about the Everglades? So that's what we've been trying to do, expand the discourse. And then we're also relying on storytelling a lot because that's what the Miccosukee and Seminole folks are doing. They're relying on their stories as a foundation for their care and protection for the land. And so that's what we've been doing too. We've been teaching folks to rely on their own storytelling. And what are the techniques that we use for storytelling? 
So in doing this work, we're also seeing that um, it's important to supplement the knowledges that are out there. A um, lot of great scientific work, but what about the indigenous traditional ecological knowledge? So we're finding ways to uplift that because science does great work, but it can have a very limited perspective. And in that limited perspective, it's very easy to erase the presence and the history and the futures of indigenous folks. Like science, unfortunately, is being used for that. So we need to be careful about that. And ultimately, I guess we're trying our best to bring people together, right? Because that's where the magic happens. So we love to do events where folks can come together in fun recreational things or in educational moments or even for actions out on the street. Because I feel like that's where the magic happens when you bring people together. So I feel like that's why we want to uplift and celebrate the work of what people like Betty Osceola, Robert Rosa, and others are doing. Because whenever they do their events, whether those are direct actions or prayers or what have you, they always make people feel safe and welcome and celebrated. And I think that that's something that we got to celebrate. So I guess just looking forward, um, there's a lot of love that, that needs to be shared with these places around the peninsula. And just keep in mind that the Miccosukee and Seminole folks are constantly inviting us to participate. Um, the, there's going to be an art, ex art exhibit next week in the Everglades. The Miccosukee tribe is hosting their festival in December. And there's a whole bunch of activities that the Seminole tribe is doing in February. And all this is to say that there's opportunities for us to make friends with our indigenous hosts and our indigenous neighbors and to be in solidarity with each other and with the land. But I'm looking forward to seeing what my colleagues have to share, and I'm looking forward to being in conversation with y'all. So thank you very much. I appreciate y'all. Thank you, Houston. Betty Asciola is a Native American environmental activist, educator, and clean water advocate. She's a member of the Miccosukee Tribe of Indians of Florida from the Panther Clan. Born and raised in the Everglades, she utilizes her upbringing in the greater Everglades and the indigenous traditional ecological knowledge of the Miccosukee and Seminole people to educate and advocate for environmental conservation. She's an airboat captain and the owner and operator of Buffalo Tiger Airboat Tours on the Tamiami Trail in Miami, Florida. And if you haven't had an opportunity to go down there and go out on an airboat ride with her, it is fantastic and she has so much knowledge to share. And she uses that experience to educate the public about the Miccosukee and Everglades ecosystems. She also serves on the Miccosukee Tribes Everglades Advisory Committee. In 2018, Osceola received the John V. Kabler Grassroots Organizing Award during the Everglades Coalition Annual Summit. And in 2023, the PBS Native America documentary, Betty Osceola, Earth Protector, profiled her environmental protection efforts and prayer walks to save the Florida Everglades. Osceola is featured in the recent documentary release, The Path of the Panther. Please join me in welcoming Betty. Oh, um, thank you for having me here today to um, provide some words and hope you um, to leave you with some thoughts. Let me put my eyes on here. Okay. You know, um, being a member of an indigenous tribe, you know, for me, I'm very fortunate to be born um, Seminole, Descendancy Creek, and Miccosukee, and I think that really has helped shaped who I am today with all these different collective experiences. And here, um, indigenous activism. I know a, a lot of times people are, you're an environmental activist, you're, you know, you're a cultural rights activist. And for myself, I'm just being an indigenous person trying to have a place to exist and making sure that our youth have a place to exist to um, carry that on. And, you know, existing is an act of resistance. And through our identity of who we are as a people, for many generations, the fact that we're still here today, we've had a lot of years of examples of how to resist and be who we were meant to be. And that's mainly what guides me in how I am as an individual. You know, cultural tr uh, tr and tradition and knowledge is very important. 
we raise our children to, um, from birth to understand their chemistry with uh, each other and the environment around them and listening to the stories of our elders. And you know, for us, we're not told, okay, this is how you have to do it, this is how you have to do it. it. Our form of education is through observation and listening of the stories and sharing of the stories, which is very important. Because we have, have a saying, you know, you, to know where you're going, you have to know where you came from. You have to have, like the roots of a tree, you have to have a strong um, roots to keep you balanced. And our way of life, we call it the circle of life because everything is interconnected with each other. And this way of life, um, you know, made me who I am today. And using that knowledge, you know, how can I, as a Miccosukee woman, as a Miccosukee person, ensure that our future generations, um, I'm a grandmother, I have grandchildren, how their, my grandchildren, their grandchildren of all our peoples, not just the Miccosukee, have a place to exist. And some of the things that I've um, done and learned from my own elders, you know, I apprenticed with my late uncle Bobby C. Billy when he needed help, he came to me when he needed help to stop a project that was gonna essentially create a second dam across the Florida Everglades. And that's that photo all the way up in the left corner there. You see the flag that he had created and the staff with the eagle feathers where we made a stop to observe how the landscape can heal itself. And a fire was going through. Um, it was a, a man-made fire, but we were explaining how you know the earth regenerates itself through fire. So not only do we do prayer walks, but we impart some indigenous knowledge in that um, along the way and what the landscapes wants us to share. And we, um, after five years of doing prayer walks, we were able to stop this project, and, um, but we're always vigilant that it could come back. And through that uh, mentorship, my uh, uncle has since passed, but instead of stopping and saying, well, he's no longer here, the work stops, I continued on. And I think that's what is important about our elders when they impart that knowledge to us. And out of that, that center top photo is where um, we were um, did a prayer walk to help heal our relationship with water. And in essence, healing our relationships with each other as human beings in that connection. Because that prayer walk around Lake Okeechobee I organized it at a time when there was so much animosity between communities around the lake and so much animosity of human beings towards the lake itself. And using that opportunity to not only pray for everyone um, that was involved in that situation, but to heal those relationships and to get people to understand. Because doing prayer walks, it's more than just setting dates and getting people to show up and all that organization. For me, because I'm a very spiritual person, and how I was raised, it's getting those messages of what the environment wants to be told. In this particular walk, the, um, I went ahead of time to pray and ask the lake how I could help her. And then the message I got from that lake was, you know, make them understand. Make them understand that I'm not hurting them. They are hurting me. That's what that walk was about, to educate how human beings are hurting the lake. She's not hurting anyone, because over time, periodically, we're here, and you'll see in the news of the algal blooms, and everyone's blaming the lake. They're not blaming themselves for putting that pollution in the lake. They're, they demonize the lake, and they don't want these discharges of the lake of the waters, in essence, continuing to harm the lake itself, because the failure of human beings to realize that we need to make a change in our lives and help reduce nutrient pollution and to do better. And that's what um, the essence of what I do is to help human beings come back to being human beings and reconnecting with themselves and nature, that there's a better way of doing things. And the other photo here up on to the top corner right is during um, we took out the National Academy of Sciences because I am on the tribe's environmental advisory committee and sometimes I go out with the tribe on different activities and this one was for um, every year Congress mandates that they have to do a grade report on Everglades restoration so we took out a group of scientists that are involved in that process to show them the tribal land so, and show them the areas that we still have concern on and um, so that they can get our tribal um, input. And then on the bottom left corner, 
where I'm standing on, on the island. That happens to be um, Houston's family's island where the little pot sits. And we're fortunate that their family, uh, Otter Clan, lets us use these islands periodically to um, use for education. Here we have um, state legislator, Congress people, people from the Army Corps, people from South Florida Water Management, all different agencies to explain what our concerns are in the, the Everglades. And I've um, partnered up with other um, environmental organizations to make this happen so we can continue to educate the decision makers on the ground, you know, our concerns, because sometimes they're sitting in an office looking at a piece of paper and they don't really understand the impact of their decisions. This other photo in the bottom center is one of the um, prayer walks that we had for um, Walk for the Homies that we're doing to educate the public. This one, my nephew is leading the walk and I'm just there to be of assistance and help guide him through that because in order to keep advocating for the environment, our culture teaches us to um, train our replacement. Every good leader always trains the person that comes behind them. They don't always keep that knowledge to themselves. And every good leader never calls himself a leader. And that's what we teach and um, uh, through guide and experience for other people, to, for our youth to lead. Here, we're educating about the, the legislation that was passed to pursue studying using radioactive waste from the gypsum stacks on, on resurfacing roadways here in Florida and how that's not um, a very good thing to do. But also continue to educate and pray for the landscape. And this bottom right photo is my recent photo that I put up on TikTok. It's up to, I think, over a million views right now, where our tree islands are flooded on our tribal reservations. And we're going on five months. And um, I, I periodically do this to show the urgency of decisions that need to be made because we've lost 70% of our tree islands due to inundation of water and mismanagement of water. And we're down to only 10% of, in the state of Florida, your, your wading bird populations, you only have about 10% of your wading bird populations and the animal populations of Florida, you're only down, you, you, you've lost 90% of your wildlife here in all of Florida. And trying to educate the decision makers, what we have to do better and we have to work towards healing the environment, not manipulating the environment. Another thing that we do about defending the, the ancestors, and here are some photos of a site that myself along with Robert Rosa and others were trying to get this site preserved um, because there's a developer that wants to put up um, um, shops and apartments on top of a, a Tequesta village site. And even though there were human remains we found, we want them put back. And we've been trying to educate, that's what these, um, uh, the two, the, the large photo with the archaeologists excavating is, and the one on the top right is associated, that was taken at the Miami Circle where my, my late uncle Bobby C. Billy and other indigenous people fought long and hard to protect, and they got it protected. So we're trying to protect this other site. And then the bottom photo is in Jupiter. We have another developer trying to actually dig into a mound to build on that site. So we're trying to protect Sunni Sands in Jupiter, so that's what I have ongoing now. And that's it for me, so thank you and I'll be happy to answer questions and have conversations with you later. Thank you, Betty. Dr. Thomas Pluckon is a professor, professor of anthropology at the University of South Florida, specializing in the archeology span of the Southeast U US. His research focuses on the understanding of small-scale social formations, particularly on the Native American societies of the Woodland period, 1000 BC to AD 1050, in this American and Southeast, and those of the Swift Creek and Whedon Island cultures of the Gulf Coast. He received his PhD from the University of Georgia in 2002. He is the author of numerous articles and two books, Kolomoki, Settlement, Ceremony, and Status in the Deep South, 8350 to 750, published by the University of Alabama Press in 2003, and New Histories of Village Life at Crystal River, co-authored with Dr. Victor Thompson and published by the University of Press of Florida in 2018. Welcome, Dr. Pluckham. Thanks to the organizers and thanks to my fellow panelists. Um, 
I took the liberty of kind of playing with the title, and this is kind of a nod to Houston's work. I kind of inserted some bracketed things along the lines that he does in his film. So uh, what remains at USF in terms of the ancestral remains that USF has acquired over the years, and listening finally, belatedly, I would say, and imperfectly to indigenous perspectives. Um, I, I feel the necess necessity to start with an apology um, I've said this to the tribes that we consult with in terms of repatriation, but um, um, personally, on the behalf of our department, and to the extent I'm able on the behalf of USF, you know, we've made some mistakes and we're trying to do better. Um, so to condense the history of anthropology into five minutes, uh, so uh, anthropology, like a lot of academic disciplines, traces its roots back to the, around the turn of the century. Um, in 1902, Franz Boas founded the first department of anthropology at Columbia University. And um, anthropologists are proud of the fact that Boas had this concept of cultural relativ relativism that was really an antidote to the scientific racism that permeated the 19th century. But Boas and his students also had this feeling that Native American groups were disappearing because of the effects of colonialism. And they, they, they thought it was their responsibility to do what came to be known as salvage ethnography, um, to document those tribes in as much detail as they could. And that meant collecting, uh, collecting stories, collecting vocabularies, collecting objects, sometimes sacred objects. Um, and you know, a lot of universities and departments of anthropology are dealing with that legacy. Um, skipping ahead a few decades to the 1930s, during the Depression, the WPA, the TVA, um, put people to work doing archaeology, especially in the southeast U.S., and um, that in, meant a lot of excavations, and that meant excavations of tens of thousands of Native American burials. Uh, fortunately, um, you know, USF was not in existence at that time. So we don't have to deal with those collections that originated from those 1930s excavations, but the universities of Georgia, Florida, Kentucky, Alabama, Tennessee, you know, are still dealing with that legacy and they still hold, hold tens of thousands of Native American uh, remains from those excavations in the 1930s. Um, so USF, uh, that was chartered in 1956, actually started classes in 1960. And those classes included um, classes in anthropology. And anthropologists were really uh, kind of ahead of the game, especially when you consider recent developments in Florida. Um, my predecessors in the Department of Anthropology in the 1960s, early 1960s, before the civil rights marches even, were teaching classes in race. Um, but they also had a cavalier attitude towards Native American remains. So. I have found, uh, it's not, sh I thought I had it on here. Uh, there's a Tampa Bay Times article from 1960, the year USF opened, that showed a USF pr professor um, excavating human remains on MacDill Air Force Base with smiling undergraduates standing over uh, a Native American skeleton. I didn't have the picture of the skeleton, but I had a picture of the story. Um, and. In the 1960s, this kind of, uh, another, there were a couple other developments that kind of pushed archaeology to, to continue this collecting tradition. So in 1966, the National Historic Preservation Act became law, and um, this law requires federal agencies to take historic properties into account when they, on federal projects. And it led to a whole industry that we know as contract archaeology or CRM, cultural resource management. And today, most of that work is done by private companies, but in the 60s and 70s, um, much of it was done by universities. And so USF began um, in, the, in the 70s advertising its program for doing contract archaeology or salvage archaeology. Um, and in 1974, we're kind of a point of pride is that we actually became a department of an applied anthropology where we specifically trained students for careers outside of academia. Um, and a lot of that was training students for work doing archaeological compliance um, for, with this federal law. And so the downside of that, though, is in the 70s, we started doing these projects, and um, they often involved salvage excavations of Native American graves. So for example, when a power plant was built in Martin County, 
USF archaeologists did uh, excavations in, in to precede the construction um, that included excavation of Native American graves. Uh, we have, you know, they also did projects for road widening, salvage excavations when graves were discovered in Hillsborough County, um, and some private development even. Um, and so we don't do that any longer, but we're dealing with the legacy of those, that work that was done in the 70s, uh, 60s, 70s. Also, in the, you know, over the years, in the 70s and 80s in particular, we started accepting donations of Native American human remains from local museums and individuals. We sort of became a repository of last resort for people that found Native American remains while they were hiking. So we've got stuff that people found eroding from beaches. Um, we have remains that were housed in now defunct museums. Uh, the predecessor to the aquarium in Clearwater was a thing called the Seorama um, that had Native American remains on display and somehow we had, those were donated to us. Um, we, had, we have human remains from the predecessor of Mosey, which was the Hillsborough Re Regional Museum. Um, so we, you know, we became this repository of last resort, like I said. The tide started to change in the 1980s, um, and I won't go into much detail, but the main thing was the passage of the Nas Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, or NAGPRA, in 1990. Um, and USF anthropology complied with the, and I, I assume most people are aware of NAGPRA, but it, one of the things it does is it requires uh, institutions that receive federal funds like USF to inventory the Native American or Native Hawaiian graves that are in their control and possession. So we, uh, our department, uh, complied with this in 1995, but it was a half-hearted effort, I have to say. Uh, you could say half-assed effort, really. Um, uh, we submitted an inventory to the National Park Service, but it only listed 14 individual sets of human remains. No tribes were consulted, as far as I can tell and that all the remains were, were unilaterally determined to be culturally unidentifiable. And that's typical of the way a lot of uni universities handled this. They, anything that was older than a couple hundred years, they said that there was no clear tribal affiliation, they were culturally unidentifiable. Skipping ahead to 2010, two things happened that kind of pushed the momentum back to the native peoples and away from the scientists. Um, and first thing is that the General Accounting Office um, completed a report that faulted federal agencies for the lack of NAGRA, NAGPRA compliance. Um, and then uh, after some years of study, the Department of Interior added a new rule to NAGPRA regarding culturally unidentifiable human remains, um, which required institutions like USF to consult not just to culturally affiliated tribes, but to any aboriginal groups that lived in the area, um, federally recognized tribes. So I started at USF in 2006. I was aware of this new law and this new rule, but I was a junior professor trying to get tenure. Um, eventually though, when I got tenure and I got to be associate chair, I had some resources to start moving us towards compliance. So in 2015, I was fortunate to have a good graduate student. I'll give a shout out to Kendall Jackson, who worked with me to start re-inventorying the human remains and associated funerary objects. Um, but we lost momentum until 2019 when uh, National NAGPRA actually sent a threatening letter to USF about our lack of compliance with the new rule change to, uh, to NAGPRA. And so that kicked us into high gear. And for the past three years, I have been working to get USF in better compliance with NAGPRA by reaching out to the tribes. Um, the first thing was Reinventorying the collections, which was no small task, but we, we finally re, um, submitted a new inventory in 2020, and our, our the number of individuals in our collection went from 14 to something like 240. Uh, and uh, so that was the first step, and then we sent invitations, and we also discovered that we not only had ancestral remains from Florida, but also from isolated uh, ancestors from Arizona, Arkansas, and uh, New Mexico. Um, so that required a lot of invitations to the tribes to consult with us regarding these um, ancestral remains. We sent invitations to 100 tribes. Um, Ten tribes uh, accepted our invitation to consult. Um, and as a result of the consultation we did with the tribes, nine of those tribes uh, 
agreed that they were or claimed cultural affiliation to one or more ancestors in our in our collections. So the next step was to publish a notice in the in the what's called the Federal Register, um, and so we listed the tribes that we thought were culturally affiliated. There's a period of comment there, so other tribes can weigh in if they need to. Um, but once that period of comment had expired, we were free to begin repatriation. So we have, I'm happy to say we've repatriated the remains from Arkansas. Um, I said New Mexico, it's actually Arizona. Um, we're still working, we've determined cultural affiliation for the ancestor from California, but we're waiting for them to agree to take it back. Um, but the main task, since most of the ancestral remains in our collections are from Florida, we've been working with the two consulting tribes uh, on those, which is the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma and the Seminole Tribe of Florida. And we're working to find places to rebury those ancestors uh, that are acceptable to the tribes, which is a slow process to find areas that are suitable for reburial. Um, but um, we've successfully reburied uh, a number of the ancestors from our collections and we're continuing to work on it uh, as we go forward. And that was a quick history so I can answer any questions <laughs> later. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for sharing that very helpful and honest yet brief overview of the history of USF anthropology program. Uh, now to introduce Robert Rosa. Robert Rosa is the chairman of the Florida Indigenous Alliance, a nonprofit organization of indigenous peoples and allies working for the civil, human, natural, treaty, and sovereignty rights of the indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere. Rosa is also a member of the Central Florida Division of the American Indian Movement, AIM. AIM Florida is a nonprofit Florida organization of indigenous peoples from North, Meso, and South America working for the civil rights, human rights, treaty, and sovereign rights of indigenous peoples, as well as the recognition and protection of the rights of indigenous nations and sacred lands. Robert works with indigenous tribes to protect and preserve cultural heritage and sacred sites with human remains and artifacts. Welcome, Robert. Tagwe, Titiwano, Tatiwano, Kenegwatiwano, Didi Rara Rosa, Tarinke, Piate. What I said in my language is. Hi, brothers and sisters, and my relations. My name is Robert Rosa, and I see you. To see somebody, to see someone's breath, is to know them, to respect them, to love them. So, Tarinken Piate is to see their breath, to see their life. Um, I did have a whole spill about American Indian Movement and United Confederation of Taino People. Um, but I will tell you, there are the four S's that we go by, spirituality, sobriety, sovereignty, and support. I will uh, go through the sides, um, but after hearing the archeologists speak, I think it's very important that I have to get out that colonial, colonialists that were found in St. Augustine were studied, reburied in a cemetery. And this was in 2020. Um, yet, indigenous remains stay in museums. They stay in colleges. They're not given back with the quickness to the tribal people. He speaks of NAGPRA. NAGPRA is not strong enough. And they just revamped it. And yet it's still not strong enough. He spoke of unaffiliated remains. Indigenous people 
were given names. There were many different bands, many different clans. The colonists came and gave a name to a group of people and said, that's who you are. That's how we're going to acknowledge you. They didn't see us. They didn't care for us, respect us. And here we are, 2023, and there's still unaffiliated remains. They're still calling us out of our tribal names. I didn't mean to come here and give a spiritual spanking per se, but when I think about what's going on in Brickell, in Anclo, in Jupiter, and a lot of other places that I just can't be, even in the Caribbean, it breaks my heart and almost brings me to tears that they don't see us. That they don't see us as humans, that they don't see our ancestors as humans, that they could do what they want with them. That hurts to my core. That hurts to my soul. And when I hear somebody say, you know, we're trying to do better. There's no trying. Stand with us. Stand up with us. Let's break this legislation. 872 gives a property owner more rights than a burial. An indigenous burial. Not a colonial burial, an indigenous burial. And they've been destroyed here in Florida for many years. So any of the funerary objects that they speak of, any patrimonial objects, matrimonial objects that they speak of has been throughout the site already you know, pushed around and shoved around. And guess who gets to choose what those items are? Not us, not the indigenous folks. We protect the waters, not only for us, not for indigenous people, for everyone, because we see everyone and respect everyone. Everybody has a life, everybody has a soul, everybody has a spirit. And we care for everyone. I've been all over the U.S. I've been up to Minnesota. I've been out to Texas with Juan Mancias. I've been to D.C. I've been to Connecticut. And I don't say I, I say we, all the people. And we put our lives out there protecting. We're not what they call activists. That has gotten a dirty denotation to it. They're making it look like we are out for a fight. No, we're out to protect. That's what we do. That is what United Confederation does. That's what every tribe does. That's what AIM does. We're protecting everyone and our tribes. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. As uh, our panelists have shown us, this is a really complex issue um, and dates back centuries uh, from colonialist settlement and desecration of sacred sites and cultural traditions and ways of living. Um, Betty mentioned some of the agencies that she works with, and um, as 
federal policies like NAGPRA and tribal consultations are uh, maybe constructed to give the appearance of engaging indigenous communities in cultural heritage and environmental policies um, and implementing these policies at federal, state, and local levels. I kind of wanted to give uh, sort of a opportunity to, to understand how many agencies and institutions and organizations that you all work through in this sort of network, that this kind of maze that we have to, you, you navigate in the, in the advocacy work that you do. And so I wanted to see if you could share with us some of those um, relationships or agencies that you've kind of worked with over your efforts in the history. I'll give an example of the situation that we have now that I had what in the slide where is um, open the gates. There's the Army Corps of Engineers, there's South Florida Water Management, there's Florida Fish and Wildlife, there's U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, that is a part of that process. And unfortunately, they don't see us, even though our tree islands are flooded, in the operating manual to open those gates to get to relieve the water off of tribal lands in the central Everglades and to allow it to flow on further down south into the part of the Everglades that's in the boundaries of Everglades National Park is that the trigger to open those gates is a threat to human life. So recently our tribe you know, was told, well, we can't open the gates because there's no threat to human life. I'm like, well, you just told an Indian tribe they're not human. Think about that, we're in 2023. They still don't see us. And, and also, you know, um, on tribal lands in the central Everglades, there's over 19 endangered species in those areas that are under threat because of these high waters. But yet, one their rationale to not open the gates on the western portion of um, where the, um, the water needs to, to flow out to relieve the flooding they're protecting one, sing, uh, one single endangered species, the Cape Sight Sparrow. And so in order to protect that one species, they uh, continue to endanger and threaten the other species and the Miccosukee tribe themselves in their way of life because on these islands are our ancestors, their remains. On these islands, we practice our traditions, our ceremonies. On these islands, we grow our crops. So keeping those islands flooded is impacting our personal lives. These are our homes. And it's a very complex issue. And I imagine, unfortunately, if the demographic, that face of that demographic would look different, the gates would have already been opened. And that's a part of what we're doing in our um, trying to get people to understand we're human beings too. And our resources, in our way of life, our tribal lands are important. Our scientists are working with our people and collaborating with people like Houston and myself and other tribal people to help our lands flourish, to bring in back the wildlife. But we can't bring back wildlife when you have it flooded, the Everglades flooded over six feet. A raccoon, possum, even deer can't thrive or survive. The animals are being displaced, and we, and we are the voice of the voiceless, the plants and the trees, everything. And it's, it's very hard. And even with like the Brickell site, where that's a known Tequesta site that's connected to the Miami Circle, a broad, on both sides of the Miami Canal, that's all one the, um, historic area of the Tequesta peoples. But because of imaginary lines and roads and divisions and property lines, they're asserting that the area where this development is um, being excavated for is not sacred. The objects aren't sacred. The ancestors aren't sacred. But that's not indigenous people saying that. It's non-indigenous people saying that. Someone else talking for us. And even though we're in meetings advocating, say we have to speak for ourselves. We determine, you know, these, uh, we, you know, who, you know, 
when objects are found, oh, well, this wasn't important to this tribe. I'm like, it's my tribe. I would know. I'm alive today. There's other forms of um, a new technology that can be braced where you don't have to actually excavate. And this individual happens to own a museum, so I imagine some of these things are going to end up in his museum. But in, he, in, in meetings, he advocates that he's the property owner. He has the right to decide where these human remains of the indigenous people go, where these significant artifacts of these indigenous people, he has that right to decide where they go. That's wrong. So I challenge the outside communities, how can we change that narrative? How can we change that narrative that to indigenous people have the right to decide where their people go, where their artifacts go. It's not an artifact, that's something sacred to us. And the human re remains being classified as artifacts that dehumanizes the indigenous people. Just like being told recently, we can't open those gates because it's not a threat to human life, apparently, and that's dehumanizing the Mikasuki people. So how can we change that narrative? That's the challenge. How can we change that narrative to, under, to have people realize we're human beings too? We're human beings too. So in, for, in the education system, organized education, how do we change that narrative that indigenous people are human beings too? Does anybody have anything they want to add? <clears throat> Betty, when you ask us that question about how can we change the narrative, I'm reminded of this event that I was talking about, this event that's happening next weekend. <clears throat> it's the arts that, um, that we're like using to help open up pathways for that because you're talking about how difficult it is to even address the topic of things like environmental racism and I, I see the challenges that we're experiencing throughout the state uh, with regards to the censorship. But I feel like for us, like we're trying to use the arts to, to bring attention to these things because sometimes we may not be able to say certain words in certain rooms, but maybe we can use a combination of color or movement or something to open up people's hearts and minds. So I think that's like one of the ways that we've been trying to, to keep the conversation moving forward through the arts. So if y'all can, I know it's a trek, but if y'all can make it out to the Everglades next weekend, or even just follow on Instagram this account called Voices of the River of Grass. Um, they're doing amazing work, like bringing attention to these issues and bringing folks out there too, like having the actual art exhibit in the Everglades. And that way people can not only get inspired, but also see the kind of issues that you're um, showing us every day through your advocacy, Ms. Betty. So thank you for constantly asking those difficult questions, because when you ask those questions, like it compels us to try, and we need people to keep asking those kind of questions, so thank you. And Houston, you, you speak about your activism as a form of, a creative form of healing. Mm. Um, I have a quote here. Um, Whether we are provoking new perspectives or new feelings or leading the way to new processes or conceptualizing new imaginary worlds, it's about dreaming things into action. And um, one of the things that the exhibition does is it engages indigenous archives, both historic and contemporary representation to excavate repressed histories of colonization and ongoing impacts of eviction from native lands and cultural erasure um, to promote uh, and these works promote visual and cultural sovereignty as a form of self-representation, as well as expand the collective memory for indigenous communities, um, contemporary and future um, communities um, and people. So I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about how cultural sovereignty is intertwined with um, both the environmental advocacy and stewardship of your tribal history and heritage? 
Any, I mean, anybody, anybody, yeah. anybody can talk about it. <laughs> yeah, because I think, um, I think Ms. Betty was kind of pointing to some of the ways that we can move forward in that by being able to tell our own stories. Um, I just came back a couple weeks ago from this film festival in Toronto called Imagine Native, and they're all about indigenous cinemas. And I'm super happy that we are at the point where we can talk about indigenous national cinemas. Like, what are the stories on screen of the Miccosukee and Seminole people? What are the stories on screen of Taino folks? And so, like, it, it's about um, the dignity of being able to tell our own stories, like Ms. Betty and others were saying. And we had this conversation um, just prior to the talk, but it's about the fact that our stories are being portrayed as unreliable. As, as false or illogical because we have a reliance on mythology or spirituality. And so I think that um, as, as we tell our own stories that, that these things become legitimate, that these things become celebratory and these things become the foundation for um, the policies that are um, bringing back these species that are in decline. So I think, I think something as simple as, as a dream or as the poem in our own voices can definitely lead the way to positive change on the ground because that's what, that's what our folks and that's what our ancestors have done. Um, this island that Betty was pointing out that um, she's taken visitors to, to visit, that my mom and others are caring for, um, it was the site of some atrocities back in the day, but because of our storytelling, because of our connection to the land and the medicine, like we were able to bring healing to that spot. So I think the more we speak up, the more we sing and dance and, and, and make poems and tell our stories, uh, I think that that just gives um, more weight to the advocacy that, that we are promoting on this land. Um, I don't know, these are some of the thoughts that pop up when I think about that. I don't know, what do you all think? Well, in, in sovereignty, um, first and foremost, it's, um, we're, we're still barred by it. Um, you know, the UN has declared that, that, you know, indigenous people have the right to self-determination. Yet here in America, which they're not signed on to the Native American UN Treaty, um, they refuse to sign on to it. Um, they don't see any other indigenous folks except for the ones they declare is uh, a federal tribe. So that, that goes for NAGPRA as well. Um, they have remains from the Caribbean. They have remains from Mesoamerica. Um, why ain't they allowed to receive their their ancestors back? Why 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 is it? Who says that America determines whose sovereign rights? You know. So in order for us to to let people know, we got to tell you that. Our sovereignty is being taken from us. And it's up to you to take this message and pass it on, pass it on to legislators. You know, come out there with us. You know, help. You know, somebody got to know somebody who is, um, you know, good at writing bills or knows a senator or a congressman. Help us. You know, just don't listen to our stories. We're not entertainment. You know, we could draw, we could sing, we could dance, but listen to what we're drawing. I mean, see what we're drawing, listen to what we're dancing and what we're singing. It's a call for help. You know, some of them are healing songs. Why are we still healing? Because we're still got trauma placed upon us. But there's people out here that are interested, want to learn, want to listen, want to help, but they don't know how to help. Ask us. Talk to us. Write a congressman. Say, hey, this is unfair. Start a petition. Do whatever you have to. Come out and, and come to a prayer walk. When they're, they're digging up one of our ancestors, come stand with us. You know? This helps our sovereignty. This helps them realize, hey, they're here. You know, it, it, it 
doesn't take science for people to have faith and believe somebody's word. The indigenous people, when Columbus said they were the most honest, loving people, they came over, they were in wonder of everything here in America. But then they came with lies. They came with a book, but didn't believe anything in that book. They used that book to conquer, to steal. That's not what that book was about. They couldn't follow their own laws. But there's good Christians out there. There's good spiritual people out there, Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, that know destroying somebody, taking somebody sovereignty away, is not right. So the more we speak at events like this, the more we go in, in prayer walks and speak of it and talk of it, this is the way. The more they draw of it, but just don't look at it as art, the more they dance of it, sing of it, listen, see, feel. We're talking to you. The earth is talking to you. The water is talking to you. It's all yelling for help. We're all yelling for help. Stop. They want to keep you going. Earn that money. Earn that money. Like a busy little ant going back and forth, back and forth. Stop. Breathe. Listen. See. Smell. You'll hear what's right. You'll hear your own sovereignty. Nobody could tell you what it is because you're a sovereign individual, just as we are. And before we continue, Robert, it, hearing you sh share that reminds me of like, what is, what is for me like the essence of sovereignty when I think about it? Like, I think that means like just being able to be helpful or of help. Like if somebody is in pain or hurt or somebody needs a hand up, you know, like maybe they trip and fall over, you give them a hand up. I think that's the essence of sovereignty. Like you are, you have the capacity, you have the agency and what are you gonna do with that? And I think that for me, like, I think that's like the heart of it. Like you show up, you show up for others, you show up for your friends, you show up for your family, you show up for nature, you show up for your communities. I think for me, like that's, that's what true sovereignty is, like being able to show up for others. That's part, yes. Let me chime in here. You know, back in the 1930s, there's um, a historic meeting occurred down on the Tamiami Trail at a location um, where the National Park, um, the preserve in the National Park system has a campground called Monument Lake. And um, when you Google it, it only talks about the campground. It doesn't talk about why it's called Monument Lake. But at that historic site, there is a marker there that tells what occurred. And um, in that time, um, the indigenous people, well, with the help of their allies, non-Indian non people, helped arrange a, a meeting with Governor Schultz at the time. And on that plaque, it asked the tribal people, the, the Seminoles, Miccosukees, um, because that, during that time, we were a collective group trying to exist together before um, federal recognition, but we knew, we always had our identity as our tribes. We knew who we were, but we, the governor asked our people, what do you want? How can I help you? And our elders said, Pohonchigish, leave us alone. Assert, you know, leave us alone. That one word meant leave us alone, let us, govern our, you know, continue to govern ourselves and be who we are as a people. Leave us alone. That's all we're asking is leave us alone. We already know who we are as tribal people. You know, um, our tribe under federal recognition is the Miccosukee tribe of Indians of Florida, but we ourselves, we're the Iliposnachi um, people. We speak Ilipongi. We have our clans, we have our own form of government and how we live our way of life. And unfortunately, you know, um, 
I don't see the federal government telling an Italian, you're not Italian unless I say so. You're not French unless I say so. Mm -hmm. You're not, you know, whatever ethnicity unless I say so. But to indigenous people, the federal government of the United States, you're not, of that, you're not that people unless I say so. And how we became the Miccosukee Tribe of Indians of Florida for federal recognition is because the federal government at the, at the time was trying to say, every, you know, we already recognized you. We, you have, you're the Seminole people. You're the Seminole Tribe of Florida. You know, every single indigenous person, whether they're of a different tribe or not, uh, not they're Seminole Tribe. So our people under, um, again, with the assistance of good people, like the... Um, the brother of late Janet Reno, the family of Maggie Herchula, and others went with some of our tribal elders on the airplane to Cuba. Castro gave us international recognition. Fidel Castro, before the United States of America ever did. That's not taught in history of Florida with the help of Spain. Because when Spain made the agreement with the United States for Florida, for the United States to have Florida, Spain explicitly told the United States government to honor their agreement and how they had treated the addition, uh, Spain had a, fostered a good relationship with the tribes here in Florida. And that was the condition of the, the sale of Florida to the United States was that for the United States to honor those agreements that Spain had with the indigenous people. And Spain interceded on our behalf during that time when we were in Cuba with Castro. But it took an act of resistance and having another country give us international recognition and other countries like Spain forcing the United States to recognize the Miccosukee people. And today, you talk, we talk about tribal sovereignty as a people, we know who we are. We have our tribe. For me, sovereignty is knowing who you are, where you came from, and regardless of who somebody tries to tell you or take that away from you, is not letting them take that away from you. And being true to who your identity is of your people. And, you know, in our lands, we're, it, it's still under attack. There's still a land grab going on here in Florida when the EPA turned over um, the 404 permitting process, uh, process to the state of Florida, in that turnover in legislation, they de-designated some areas from being Indian territory in that transfer. So now we're in this legal wrangle again for this land grab where the state of Florida is trying to take indigenous lands from the Miccosukee people and Seminole people. And, you know, that's where the federal um, process for the Army Corps of Engineers come in, where on the 404 permitting for um, under the federal process is was through, because we're federally recognized tribes and follow a federal process. So tribal sovereignty with that move is trying to subjugate a, 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 a federal tribe, recognized tribe under a state trying to make them follow a state instead of government to government, trying to regulate a tribe to not as a nation, but just the average ordinary citizen. Again, an intent to devalue these tribes, to undermine their sovereignty. Flooding our tribal lands is an attempt to force us to move to the suburbs and assim assimilate with the rest of the people. There's still the intent to assimilate the indigenous people into mainstream culture. That's how I see flooding of our lands, to force us to relocate to the suburbs and assimilate with everybody else. Well, we couldn't make them move during the wars. We'll flood them out so they can't live out there because they're flooded. But guess what? We're resilient and we're gonna, you know, if we have to live on our canoes, we're gonna live on our canoes. We're not going anywhere. But these are the things that the public doesn't understand that continues today. And as, uh, our people 
yeah, we're not killing each other with guns and bows and arrows anymore, but there's still that process of erasure of tribes. It's still there. And it needs to change. I do have this fact that uh, according to the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, indigenous people today safeguard 80% of our planet's diversity, which acts as a cru crucial mitigator of climate change. And uh, I wanna make sure we have time to open up questions, but I also wanna ask, um, you know, what are some of the th actions that people, non-indigenous people can take to support your efforts? Let me tackle that. <laughs> 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 right, um, I th you know, here, um, some of the, a the actions that we're doing is unfortunately, People think that in South Florida, the only Everglades is in the boundaries of Everglades National Park. Everglades restoration, billions upon billions of dollars have been spent on it. It's all about protect, when they say we're gonna save the Everglades, those projects are only designed to help the Everglades that's in the boundaries of Everglades National Park. That, those projects aren't designed to also help the central Everglades nor the northern Everglades. And we, being as you're in Tampa, you're close to Orlando and Kissimmee where the headwaters of the Everglades originated. So it's, un, um, we need you to understand and remember that the Everglades is more than Everglades National Park. When it comes to water to quality, all the water quality that the state relies on to grade themselves that they're doing this amazing job is after they filtered all the pollution through tribal lands and it comes out and right before it enters Everglades National Park, they have a gauge where they do water monitoring that when um, there's a phosphorus criterion, 10 parts per billion, even for Everglades National Park on tribal lands, but they only care about the 10 parts per billion that enters Everglades National Park, which is at the southern um, bo um, boundary of tribal lands. So our tribal lands are still being used to filter everybody else's pollution because the state of Florida considers they've done a great job once they filtered all that water and pollution out and it meets 10 parts per billion going into Everglades National Park. So we need help from the public to change that, that water needs to be cleaner further up the system to help all of the Everglades ecosystem. And we need un people to understand when they talk about water, we need to change the names from water conservation areas because those are the Everglades. But when you call it a water conservation area, it doesn't trigger somebody's thought, oh, that's the Everglades. They think it's something totally different. So we need to change those labels and we need to do better as a, a group of people, help each other, because it's all about helping each other, because it takes a village, and our people say it takes a village to raise a, a child, but it takes a village to help uplift a people. And the state of Florida is a big village that we need to uplift everyone, because this, these ecosystems support all of us. Without our ecosystems, your estuaries, your, you know, your marine fisheries, it's all interconnected and it has to work together. And it's to understand that and, and listen to the, to the people that actually live in the ecosystem. I don't come up to the estuaries and start telling the estuaries what to do because I don't live there. And I didn't grow up on them, but I'm gonna listen to the people who did. And the decisions about the ever, where the Miccosukee people live Everyone else outside of us are making those decisions for us and the ecosystem that we live in. And when we try to interject our voices, when we interject our voices, we we're, they, like our voices, they don't wanna have to listen to it. I live there, Houston lives there. Why is someone way up in North Florida making that decision of how Houston and I 
a decision that impacts our everyday life. Why is someone over in Stewart, Florida, over in Fort Myers, making that decision that impacts our everyday life, how we have to live our life, how our relatives live our life, in, uh, practicing our culture, helping our islands. All, everybody else is making the decision of how the Miccosukee tribe of Indians, we have to adapt, we have to expend more capital, we're having to build more infrastructure because of decisions we did not make. That's like me coming to your house and moving your couch without your permission, Repaint, redoing your kitchen without you knowing. That's me putting 10 feet of water in your house without you knowing, I just, I just did it. And that happens sometimes too. Decisions other people are making without talking to us. So we need help to change that because we're not coming up here and making those decisions for any of you in the room or anyone else in these communities. But for some reason, all these other agencies and communities think they have the right to decide what happens on Indian tribal lands and to Indian people. We need help to change that. Um, how many have had a family member or friend move in and um, overstay their welcome? Uh, well, you know, and de then try to invite, you know, girlfriend, boyfriend, or, or bring in a dog, cat, or whatever. But um, that's how indigenous people feel. <laughs> You know, it's like, uh, well, you know, the Europeans are here, we fed them, oh man, they're not going nowhere. <laughs> but now they're breaking our furniture, breaking our <laughs> stuff. Um, so it's time to, to wake up and, and, and say, hey, you know, enough's enough, you know. Family members, uh, friends, you gotta start working and help fix the house up. Uh, Shingle Creek we're working on right now and um, the developer had a guy from, I believe it's WPA, um, who used to work for the water management in Florida. And uh, I didn't even address him in the hearing. Um, the proof in the pudding is, is the water quality under his watch. <laughs> you know, the red tide. Um, mm -hmm you know, and, and all the pollution from everything uh, between um, just the lawns, uh, fertilizers and more, you know. So we're protecting Shingle Creek for the Everglades. They wanna rebuild over there. Um, and there's a lot of good folk in there, in, in that area that are out there with us. Um, but we need people to get active, get in there, um, send them letters, flood the emails, they see it, um, do something about it. Because all that red tide comes from all that pollution that filters out through the Everglades, the Lake Okeechobee, and then out into the waters. Um, we don't need no more development. They already took the Wetlands Act um, out and they've already tried to build up the Everglades. And what they're trying to do now is further build in and lessen the Everglades. Um, and, and we need people to speak up. We need people out there. And um, it's very important that anybody knows any congressman, anybody gonna be a representative, state representative or anything, um, put in the word, you know? Um, have him talk to, to Betty Houston, who goes out there and actually cleans up his group, goes out there and cleans up tons of stuff. Um, you have uh, Frank Weaver of Valencia is over um, on the top of the Everglades in, in Central Florida, cleaning rivers out with his group. You know, there's plenty of people out there, but we need more. We need people who care, we need people to, to, to be a good guest in the house. <laughs> You know, that, that's what it's about. Be a good guest. 
You know, don't come trashing up the apartment and say, I'm not cleaning that, you know. <laughs> Be a good guest and help. You know, go out and buy the boats, do whatever you got to do to, um, to, to help us keep it clean, keep our beaches good, keep our Everglades good, replant trees, you know, local, indi you know, indigenous to this land, not, you know, something that's from, you know, France or whatever that only, you know, should be there. Find out what grows here in Florida, what was the original plants, plant them. Mm -hmm. And that helps. I, I believe Houston, you're, yeah. you're doing stuff like that, correct? Yeah, um, we are um, promoting native plant species in all of our work. And we just finished up a community garden on the Megasuki Reservation, like trying to support what they're doing on the land. So native species, yeah. yeah. Um, I guess I just want to offer something else for people to think about that they can take action on is to support indigenous science work because earlier I was critical of other types of science work, the kind of sciences that are misused or misinterpreted. But if you look at what the Miccosukee EPA, because the Miccosukee tribe have their own EPA, what the Miccosukee EPA is doing with their science is finding a way to balance native knowledge with the knowledge that's being produced by the scientific method. So if you want to see how it's done, check in with the Miccosukee tribe scientists and see what they're doing. So whatever you can do to support indigenous-led sciences, I think will, will help us to, to move forward together. Mm -hmm. And um, to piggyback off Houston, on the, um, on the internet, if you put in your Google search, Secret Islands of the Everglades, Ooh, a there's a quick, uh, it's a very short film, but a very uh, information-packed short film that is showing how the tribe is and their scientists are working together, the tribal members and the scientists are working together, um, showing the, what we understood about the environment and science is showing what we understood about how the ecosystem is and how it thrived through the sciences supporting that. And also um, another, um, and you, in that film was also to show the importance of the tree islands in the, um, as a part of the ecosystem. Because we have, the Everglades has lost 70% of their tree islands. And which translated to the 90% of loss of wildlife here in Florida. And um, also there's, uh, the tribe is, will be coming out later um, we really can't, um, until the official trailer comes out, we can't um, say what that project is until we get the, we're able to put it out. But if you, um, on YouTube, if you put in, I mean, not YouTube, but if your Google searches, if you put, you know, Miccosukee Tribe and um, Environment, it should um, come up. Um, I don't know when, um, when on, on my personal um, social media, I'm on Facebook. For those of my age and older, we're Facebookers, right? <laughs> <laughs> For the younger crowd, Instagram and TikTok. But um, when I get the link, because we just um, finished um, filming um, the tribe uh, with a French um, film crew um, for their version of PBS in France about the Everglades, that'll be coming out. So I'll post, once I get the, the link, and their, um, I'll put it on my social uh, media page. And then the, when, and also the official trailer on the other projects that the tribe is w working, I'll post that on my um, social media. So you can always uh, uh, give me a follow. Also too, I wanna put a plug for all indigenous people. Um, and um, I believe later on uh, USF through one of their um, sites, I'll put, put up um, the link for it, is PBS is doing a wonderful series. They're on their second year um, with Native America and, and showcasing what other tribes are doing in their community. So if, if you could go and watch that and like that, because without um, public support, um, there will not be a season three. They've done season one and two. And there's some very good important stories being shared through um, indigenous America that, um, and we need to continue to, that's another way the public can help is to continue to help this public broadcasting
continue to share those stories and documenting those stories. And the producers on the on these this project for Native America are indigenous producers and filmmakers putting these series together. And, and that's a part of telling our own stories. We have indigenous people going out and interviewing other indigenous people and putting these stories together. So PBS Native America. My, my portion where I'm interviewed in comes out November 7th. Go on and watch that online. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. If you could speak up so we can get it on the recording. And tell us your name, please. I'm Colin. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yep. Awesome. So a very good friend of mine has raised um, these things in honey. So these things being challenging things that are going on and honey being positive things that are going on. So for the panel in general, what are some these things in honey about your task and your calling that you notice today? I'm just going to repeat that for the recording. So Colin's asking, uh, using this metaphor of bee stings and honey, about what are some of the uh, challenges, the bee stings, and what are some of the rewards or um, uh, achievements of the, the work in, that you each are doing? Um, I'll go with that. The prayer walks, the bee sting, the current bee sting, the radioactive materials that they want to use to resurface Florida roads. The prayer walk, each prayer, it's about healing, right? And bringing back people to be human beings and using the prayer and spirituality and education about an issue. The bee sting, the challenge, how to stop that, right? Because that legislation was passed to pursue and do an experiment to see if it's feasible. And that bee sting is preventing it from happening and further contamination to the environment and um, impacting um, everything of that environment. But the beauty out of the prayer walks, even though we've suffered <laughs> 100 degree plus heat, and um, seeing the determination and the strength of the people in those walks, and seeing the little ones, our youngest one is, I think he's two years old, he's about two years old, right? Jessica's a little boy, two years old, and you know, these um, families bringing their kids out and seeing the, the, the younger generations a part of that, that's the honey. But also, at, after every prayer event, vigil, walk, seeing um, the people evolve and change. And sometimes we have people um, where years later they come back and how some, sometimes we hear stories of how we saved their life. Because they, these are you know educational walks, but they're also healing walks. And, and people have, almost like when people go to church and give testimony, right? And how because of being a part of a prayer walk, how they viewed the world from a different lens and it impacted how they lived their daily lives or encouraged people to go into politics to become or to become educators or become scientists or people that were just trying to find a better way. And um, we've, we've saved some lives. We've had one person came and didn't think he was going to be around for a while. Personally was going to ensure he wasn't around for a while, but He's around for a while now and thriving and, and living his life, you know, so that's the honey I've seen. I would like to share in terms of um, coalition building or arts advocacy. Um, thinking about the bee sting is transient communities because people have their lives and their careers and people might stay in the city for a year or two before they get a better job and move on. And so even that happens in environmental nonprofits. So the bee sting is um, that, like people are coming and going and sometimes it feels like you have to start all over again. Same thing with federal agencies and state agencies. They also move on in their careers. So that's the sting of like, who do I have to deal with today? Um, 
but the honey of it is the endless creativity and the endless innovation that comes when you have to reinvent or start over or tell the story in a different way or where do you start the story again. So again, it comes into the innovations of storytelling because you can start in the beginning and go to the middle and go to the end or you can be like Tarantino and jump all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's, that's, the, that's the honey of it. And also working with artists, I get to see the world anew every time. Like I think I live there in Everglades. You think I know his place? But once I saw this filmmaker show me what she was filming and I totally did not recognize it. So that's the joy of working with artists, the endless creativity, that's the honey. Um. The bee sting, um, we go by the four S's, spirituality, sobriety, sovereignty, and support. So the bee sting is when colonization wins, um, when somebody comes to us and wants to be spiritual, wants to do this, but they don't know how to live in the two worlds. and. Um, they can't get what, what, what you're trying to show them and what the elders are trying to show them. And the honey is those who can, those who can learn to live in the two worlds, to be indigenous, but also be in the modern society and learn how to work within both of those realms per se. And um, to see them blossom, become leaders, to see them get that, that original teaching and to go from just talking away to not even talking anymore and listening to every elder's word. That's the honey. When I see one of my brothers, one of my sisters out there just listening instead of doing what colonization has taught us, just to talk and dismiss. And um, that I find the honey is when they, they start to get it and they become one. Thank you. Tom? Um, I've been trying to listen in this panel, so I was <laughs> waiting to talk. Uh, uh, I, coming back to the repatriation, I mean, Robert brought up some of the problems with NAGPRA, and I mean, it's not a perfect law. In 872, the state law is far from perfect. Uh, so, uh, you know, the bee sting is, uh, and, you know, we're, I still have resistance from some colleagues to repatriating stuff, so, um, you know, I get it from all sides. Uh, you know, Native peoples rightfully want to vent about the injustices of the past. I'm still dealing with colleagues that are still in a colonial mindset. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of hassles to, to trying to do this work. Uh, but the honey is, you know, we've had, it's been gratifying to work with some of the tribes and, and put some of these ancestors back in the ground and have to have them thank us for those efforts is, you know, reward. Do you think that Sorry, <laughs> um, that your organization, the college, could move past just doing the NAGPRA and um, listening and, and, and looking at what remains they have and repatriate them to those tribes who don't fall under it? Well, you know, NAGPRA is a federal law that we are bound by. I mean, we legally have to comply with NAGPRA. Um, the changes to NAGPRA do allow for the potential for repatriation uh, to state-recognized tribes, non-federally recognized tribes, but there's an order that we have to follow The you know. It's weak, yeah, yeah. I've read it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so really we're legally bound to work through the, the federally recognized tribes. Um, and specifically those that respond to our invitation. Just so you know, slavery was legal. Yeah. Yeah. But you could morally say, hey, I'm gonna do it 
the college agrees, I've talked it over with, you know, mm -hmm. plus, eh, bring it up, you know, that's how we start to get that NAGPRA changed. That's how we start to get mm -hmm. 872 changed, it is with good folks like yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a complicated issue because there's also the issue that some of the federally recognized tribes don't want to, don't want us to do, to broaden that. I haven't met, I work with federally recognized tribes and I haven't met one that says they would love to see the Caribbean people get their people, their people back. They would love to see Mexico, uh, uh, Mexica, Aztecs, um, I can name many tribes in South America. I have not met one federal tribe that says they would not like them to get their remains back. Uh, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't referring to those oh. cases, but yeah. There was another question uh, back there. Yes. Hi, uh, Dave Coleman, and I have a question for the doctor. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, a uh, local activist joined with um, Jeannie Munger to save the USF Forest Preserve. And my question is, I haven't heard much about it. Um, there were incidences of grave robbers going in there. So how secure is the site? And, um, in, and what can you give me the impression that you have about whether it's going to remain in perpetuity? You know, is it, is it going to be a safe place or is it in danger again? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, after that happened, uh, for those who don't know, USF has a, a large nature preserve undeveloped uh, on the north side of Fletcher, and it does have a, 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 a burial site that was excavated in the 1930s, uh, large parts of it anyway. Um, but there was, that was maybe two years ago, uh, there was a, an incident where um, someone uh, illicitly dug on the site. Um, and so USF uh, responded by, um, of course, forming a committee, but the committee did, did uh, some good work. Um, we, we talked about ways to improve the security, um, but it also, um, I, I think USF is now committed to not developing, de developing that property. The golf course might be redeveloped, as I understand it, at some point. Uh, they've closed the golf course, um, but the, the nature preserve to the east of that um, is going to be maintained as such. Um, and in terms of the security, uh, we, you know, the committee made some recommendations uh, about f signage, fencing. Um, they have put up some security cameras, so things have improved in that regard, I'm happy to say. They stole one of the cameras. There, were, there weren't any cameras when, they, when the they, digging took they, place. But they since put the, up the field cameras, the game cameras, and somebody stole them. I was, I was out there at the site when all, all that was going with the, what they wanted to build on it and all that jazz. And yeah, and I think they proposed now a building, an environmental building near it. There is some talk about some sort of, because uh, there are some classes, especially in the environmental sciences, that use it uh, you know, as, uh, for student you know, learning about forestry and um, environmental management and stuff. So there is some talk. Um, the, the actual burial site is pretty isolated uh, by swamps and not easy to get to. Um, there, I, you, you could probably get a difference in opinion, but a lot of people think it might improve the security to have a little bit more of a presence somewhere on that property, because right now, part of the problem is that people don't go out there often enough to monitor. Right, So correct. Yes, there's a question here. Um, I'm Sheila. I
here in the United States, I don't involve anywhere where they're really having as positive um, um, interactions, but I haven't visited every single tribe in the United States either. <laughs> so um, that being said, you know, I think um, because of in South America, because you have more um, indigenous communities and where a broader, you know, where they were able to establish the rights of nature, you know, in South America that was indigenous led to give nature that rights. I understand that there's a, an initiative here in Florida, which um, I don't champion, by the way, because it wasn't, in cra it wasn't crafted by indigenous people. They came after the fact to look for a um, poster child. And so I think because America has, um, the United States has a lot of different um, populations and different um, upbringings, and especially here in Florida, um, that's that initiative that's trying to um, be pushed here in Florida. It's open to too much interpretation because they want to put it in the, the court system. And unfortunately, it's, it's like a police officer, right? You break a law, but whoever that police officer is on site, it's up to their interpretation of the law at the time. Just like when you would go before a, a, a judge, right? They have to interpret what the intent of that law was. So the rights of nature and trying to get it on the ballot and stuff like that, unfortunately with our state legislature, um, and we can see what's been going on, especially in academia, right? <laughs> um, you know, doesn't, um, it's not gonna be a good thing. And because, especially when they talk about indigenous beliefs and um, how we um, are as a people, Miccosukee people don't go and speak for Seminole tribal people. We don't go speak for the Navajo people. We don't go speak for the Taino people. We don't go speak for all these other people because they, they each have their unique way of viewing things. Sometimes we have similarities, and I think sometimes when people say, oh, well, this is indigenous base, but which tribe? Which clan? We're, we're members of the same tribe, but he's Otter Clan, I'm Panther Clan. The way he was raised is a little bit different than how I was raised, but we have some basic similarities, but we also have roles that our clans played within the overall arching of the tribe and our ceremonies. So my clan would never go tell his clan what to do and vice versa. We may ask and seek guidance and say, hey, hey, how did, how did you learn, you know, what, what was your clan's take on this? What, what was the stories you heard about this? And we would talk about it. Our, our culture, we don't freely offer our opinions and say, hey, y'all should do this. It's when we're asked for our view on how we saw something done or our experiences and what we heard about it. And that's the big difference in um, what goes on in America. Everyone feels like they have the right to go tell somebody else what they should be doing. And um, that's the big problem in the world, right? Because everybody, you know, other countries wants to go tell other countries what they should be doing instead of house, you know, keeping their own house. So it's, you know, with, I guess I could think of um, with our tribe, what we, we, we did have a, a, a positive in our tribe with a local, not a government, but agency when we were able to convince them um, to fund a project that w on tribal lands that would help and restore some flow to prove, uh, improve flow in um, one of our tribal lands. And another positive, I guess, I'm thinking of not the broader government, but an agency when um, our tribe through, uh, through um, we have a wildlife department um, that um, they're responsible for um, not just the wildlife, but the health of the ecosystem. And through that department, they, were a, they worked with uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife to be able to bring in some native fish, uh, raised native fish, and bring them in to, to release them into our reservation waters to help repopulate those waters. So that was a good thing where communication was working more on the local level and um, in the agency. And also in reverse, our tribe is raising um, apple snails, the native apple snails. 
And, and because we, I, that department, that same department has been doing such a good job of it, they're being asked by other agencies for, um, to be able to receive some of those native apple cells to go release them into the, the Everglades ecosystem. And we're also raising um, garfish in um, Bofin to repopulate. So, our, so not only have we been the recipient of some um, native fish from other agencies, but because we're, we're also doing something similar, having those agencies request to be able to receive some of the, the things that, you know, our tribe, the species that our tribe is growing to help that ecosystem that's being more, you know, collaboratively. But that's, um, I don't know if Houston has any um, examples of more. I just wanna, I just wanna offer that um, the government question, examples of good relationship with governments, the governments reflect our communities, right? Like you are, the ones that elect your governments, your governments reflect what the community wants. So what I'm getting at is this, we have the potential for good relationships. Back in 2009, the federal government apologized on behalf of the country for all of the difficult experiences that our history records, all of the genocide and all of the harms that, that have happened. And so the US actually apologized for that back in 2009, but not enough people know about that. And so that federal legislation authorizes the states to do the work of reconciliation and healing. So do you want it? Do you want it enough to demand that your government and your community organizations work on it? And I've, I've seen a, a lot of really great community organizations doing the work of reconciliation, whether it's churches, whether it's museums, whether it's nonprofits, it's us. So what examples of good relationships do we want? I think we have a great potential for that. I, uh, I want to be cautious of our time, and I know this could go on forever. So we'll do one last question, and then we want to wrap up so that we can go over to the museum for the tour. We've sued the state and the federal government three times. And even though there is an agreement, a court ordered agreement, the state still finds ways to circumvent that. So how many more times do we need to sue? If they would just follow the, the original agreement. And unfortunately, this is where we are in the legal situation um, where um, because of that, it's called the settlement. If you go do a Google search, if you to you know make your tribe settlement agreement, state of Florida, it'll come up, and um, where the state and the federal agencies were supposed to do actually reduce their pollution input into tribal lands, and um, now because of the same the Supreme Court diminishing the waters of the United States, now we're back in a legal situation that's gonna impact that settlement agreement. So it, it kind of, it, for the, it's very complicated where the public were like, well, what did that have to do with, you know, a tribe's lawsuit outcome? Well, because of the arguments made in the lawsuits and also at the time, those federal waters, what they were classified as because of this recent Supreme Court decision, taking away some of those water bodies out of what are classified as, you know, waters of the United States versus a water of a state, two different things. So because of that, now we're back in a legal scenario, which is probably gonna go back to court again. And um, yes, we can litigate, but when you have the entities, when you win a judgment, you have the entities, because um, even like, um, I'll use an example, the, um, the bridge to nowhere. On the Tamiami Trail as a part of Everglades Restoration, they're building a series, of, they, they've built three um, one-mile bridges. Um, the one that is closest to Miami-Dade County 
when they were wanting to build that, the tribe litigated not it not to be built, but to actually have where more culverts were going to be put under the road instead of just one expensive one mile bridge. You know, why not help the entire road, not just one one mile of, of bridge on an eleven mile stretch of road. So we litigated over that and we won. But the individuals who wanted that bridge built went to Congress and lobbied and at the before the stroke of midnight, through an act of Congress, got that bridge built. We won the legend we won the court battle, but they went to Congress and had Congress authorize it and tell the say that that bridge had to be built. That's your politics at work. So it's not always, yeah, you can win a, win a court battle, but when those individuals go to Congress and go around it and do all these other things, then it's undermining this legal system that you've established because they find another way to do what they want to do. And I think that really drives home why we need to be active in our local communities and vote and um, have our voices be heard to enact policies that impact us here in the state of Florida and the challenges that we're facing and continue to face. I wanna thank all of our panelists uh, so much for sharing your really emotional and candid and informative perspectives. And I appreciate you all so much for being here. And um, as we walk over to the museum, you guys feel free to, uh, I know there were some other questions and I'm sorry we couldn't get to them. And I hope you'll all join us for a tour of the exhibition. Um, check out our website for upcoming events that we have um, associated with this exhibition. Please follow, love the Everglades movement. Betty Asaola is very active on her social media, uh, media platforms, Florida Indigenous Alliance and the Florida AIM chapter and the USF Anthropology Department. I don't know if Thomas has his own personal social media, but thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. <laughs>